Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Well, as we heard, today's Old Testament and Gospel readings both concern the topic and importance of prayer. In our Old Testament reading, we heard how Abraham interceded with God to spare the wicked cities of Sodom and Gomorrah for the sake of the righteous people who might be found in them. In our Gospel reading, Jesus gave the disciples and us the Lord's Prayer. We have the Lord's Prayer recorded not only here in Luke chapter 11, but the longer, more familiar version also in Matthew chapter 6. From the beginning to the end of the Bible, the scriptures speak about the importance, necessity, and blessings of prayer. God speaks to us through his word. He reveals his love for us in his son, Jesus Christ. And then we, in turn, are given the privilege to speak back to him through prayer. Prayer, quite simply, is speaking to God in words and thoughts. It's often said that there is power in prayer. It's true. But the power lies, though, not so much in the act of praying, as important as that is, but the power, of course, lies in God, who promises to hear and answer our prayers according to his good and gracious will for us as our Heavenly Father. I was reminded of that in a recent movie I saw called Breakthrough. I don't know if any of you have seen it yet. It was out in the theaters. I happened to see it on DVD, but it was quite good. For the sake of time, I just want to give you a brief synopsis of it that I found on their website. It says, Breakthrough is based on the inspirational true story of one mother's unfaltering love in the face of impossible odds. When Joy Smith's adopted son, John, falls through an icy Missouri lake, all hope seems lost. But as John lies lifeless, Joyce refuses to give up. Her steadfast belief inspires those around her to continue to pray for John's recovery, even in the face of every case history and scientific prediction. Breakthrough is an enthralling reminder that faith and love can create a mountain of hope and sometimes even a miracle. As I said, I thought it was a good movie and I commend it to you. I don't want to give too much of it away in case you want to go see it. But I especially like the last sentence of that um, synopsis. Breakthrough is an enthralling reminder that faith and love can, not will or must, but can create a mountain of hope and sometimes even a miracle. If I were to be writing this synopsis, I'd probably add to the end of that sentence, if God so wills it. And I was glad that the movie acknowledged this. Again, I'm probably giving a little bit of the movie away, but um, at toward the end of the movie, John, the boy who fell through the ice, recovered and miraculously, and he went back to school. And after class, one of his teachers asked him, the boy who almost drowned, why does God save some and not others? Now, here she wasn't talking about eternal salvation. Why do some people go to heaven and others don't. Rather, she was asking, John, why did God provide a miracle for you, but not for others? Why did you live, but my husband didn't? For you find out that her husband died of a brain aneurysm a few years before. Well, to this, John simply and correctly said to her, I don't know. I was glad this brief scene was included in the movie, for without it, viewers might come to the mistaken conclusion if, that if you just pray fervently and strongly enough, if you just believe with all your heart and get enough people to join with you, as Joyce 
Joyce's mother, uh, John's mother, Joyce, did, then God will grant you the miracle you are seeking. But this isn't true. For I know that many, many people have prayed just as hard as John's mother did for her son, including perhaps some of you. And they and you did not receive the miracle or healing you were so desperately seeking. To this, all we can say is, we don't know why. May God's will be done. I was reminded of this in another true story, this time from the Bible. Many of you, I'm sure, are familiar with the story of David and Bathsheba from the Old Testament. David was the king of Israel. He committed adultery with a woman named Bathsheba. Her husband Uriah was a soldier in David's army. And David tried to cover up his sin. Bathsheba became pregnant. And David tried to cover up his sin by having her husband Uriah killed in battle. Well, David may have thought he could cover up his sin from other people, but of course he couldn't cover it up from God, and so God sent the prophet Nathan to confront him with it. Nathan confronted David with his sin, and by God's grace and power, David repented of it. He confessed his sin. Nathan told David that he would not die because of his sin. But in a part of the story that's not told as often, Nathan also told David that the child David had conceived with Bathsheba would die. And so I'd like to read that part of the story to you from 2 Samuel chapter 12. It said, Nathan went to his own house after speaking with David. And the Lord afflicted the child that Uriah's wife, Bathsheba, bore to David, and he became sick. David therefore sought God on behalf of the child. And David fasted and went in and lay all night on the ground. And the elders of his house stood beside him to raise him from the ground, but he would not, nor did he eat food with them. On the seventh day the child died. And the servants of David were afraid to tell him that the child was dead, for they said, Behold, while the child was yet alive, we spoke to him, and he did not listen to us. How then can we say to him, The child is dead? He may do himself some harm. But when David saw that his servants were whispering together, David understood that the child was dead. And David said to his servants, Is the child dead? They said, He is dead. Then David arose from the earth and washed and anointed himself and changed his clothes. And he went into the house of the Lord and worshipped. He then went to his own house. And when he asked, they set food before him and he ate. Then his servant said to him, What is this thing that you have done? You fasted and wept for the child while he was alive. But when the child died, you arose and ate food. David said, while the child was still alive, I fasted and wept, for I said, Who knows whether the Lord will be gracious to me that the child may live? But now he is dead. Why should I fast? Can I bring him back again? I shall go to him, but he will not return to me. Well, as we heard, David prayed earnestly for his son as Joyce prayed earnestly for her son in the movie. But this time, in David's case, it wasn't God's will to work the miracle to save him, despite David's prayers and tears. However, as we heard, the story then takes a bit of an unexpected turn. After his son died, David stopped his fasting and weeping. This puzzled his servants. Shouldn't you be mourning the death of your son, they asked him. And David answered them, Why should I fast? Can I bring him back again? I shall go to him, but he will not return to me. I shall go to him one day, David said. David knew and believed that he would be reunited with his son in heaven. Do you remember the end of David's great psalm, the 23rd psalm? David confessed, 
Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I shall dwell in the house of the Lord forever. David knew and believed that one day he would dwell in God's house in heaven forever and that his son would be there. And this gave him hope, confidence, and solace for the future, even in the face of death, even when God's will for him and his son was not his will. So going back to the question the teacher asked of John in the movie, why does God save some and not others? Why does God grant miracles and healing to some and not to others? Again, all we can say is, we don't know. But may God's will be done. Now, in times of trial, we should certainly come to God in prayer, as John's mother did for her son and as David did for his. We know that God promises to hear and answer our prayers. And if the answer to our prayer is yes, well, then we rejoice greatly. But if the answer is no, we can take comfort even in our grief in knowing that death does not have the last word over God's people. Rather, in Christ, death has become the entrance to eternal life. Because we have been baptized into Christ, we have his promise that even though we die, we shall live, and that we shall have a happy reunion with those who also died in the faith of Jesus. St. Paul writes in today's epistle, In Christ also you were circumcised with a circumcision made without hands, by putting off the body of the flesh, by the circumcision of Christ, having been buried with him in baptism, in which you were also raised with him through faith in the powerful working of God who raised him from the dead. And you who were dead in your trespasses, in the uncircumcision of your flesh, God made alive together with him, having forgiven us all our trespasses by canceling the record of debt that stood against us with its legal demands. This he set aside, nailing it to the cross. My friends, the salvation Jesus won for you by his death on the cross for your sins and his resurrection Easter morning gives you reason to rejoice even in the face of death. In the Lord's Prayer, Jesus teaches us to pray, Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Thy will be done, O Lord. This was Jesus' prayer for himself in the Garden of Gethsemane. As Jesus prepared to die on the cross the next day, he prayed to his Father that this cup of wrath that he was about to drink, this suffering and death he was about to endure, might pass from him, that there might be some other way. And that Jesus prayed, Not my will, but thine be done. This is our prayer too. Thy will be done, O Lord. We pray this even when his will and ways don't make any sense to us. We pray this recognizing that it will not always be God's will to work the miracle and bring the healing we so desperately seek for ourselves and for our loved ones. We pray this knowing that even when God does provide the miracle and we rejoice in it, we remember that God, excuse me, that death will still come for each of us one day. For death is the just consequence of our sin. And so the healing that God desires for us is not simply the healing of our bodies, as important as that is, but it's the healing of our souls. And this comes only through faith in his Son, Jesus Christ. As Jesus said, This is the will of my Father, that everyone who looks on the Son and believes in him should have eternal life, and I will raise him up on the last day. Quite simply, God's will is that people would come to know and believe in him. And so sometimes he permits and even sends tragedies into our lives for the purpose of making himself known to us. That people would not trust in themselves, but would trust in him 
and would have eternal life through faith in Jesus Christ. The movie Breakthrough provided an example of this. The firefighter who rescued the boy from the lake was an atheist. However, after witnessing the miracle that had taken place and hearing God's word, he came to faith in Jesus. And so we pray, Thy will be done, O Lord. We pray this recognizing that though we don't see the whole picture of life in this world, how everything fits together, that God does. That as scripture says, God works all things together for good for those who love him and are called according to his purpose. And so we pray to him, confident that he desires what is best for us, even when what is best doesn't seem to be best. We pray to him confident that what we believe now in him by faith, one day we will see with our own eyes that his kingdom will come and that one day the tears and questions of this world will be no more. Amen. And now may the peace of God, which passes all understanding, keep your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. Amen. <laughs>